Ephesians 4, 32, I'm going to read the context. The forgiven must forgive. The forgiven must forgive. <clears throat> I'm going to begin at verse 25. Therefore put away lying. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, do not sin, do not let your the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word precede out of your mouth, but what is good for edification, necessary edification, that it may be <clears throat> impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom, uh, of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And here's our text. <coughs> Our text is 32, but I'm going to talk about 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind, here's our text, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. So that's our text, verse 32. There's a parallel passage in Colossians we'll look at later. <coughs> In this section on sanctification, we're in this really crucial section on sanctification, one of the best in the New Testament, by the way. Um, Paul addresses how God requires Christians who themselves have been forgiven a mountain of debt. We've all been forgiven thousands of sins over our lives. <clears throat> must forgive other believers who have sinned against them. So we have here, it's a requirement. It's not a voluntary thing. It's a requirement by God. It, this is exceptionally important and necessary topic in that, number one, Christians are made up of people who still sin and offend others. We're all sinners. There's going to be sins and offenses with people. Number two, without forgiveness and reconciliation, church communities will break down, split into factions, and or become revolving doors due to personal offenses and emotional um collisions. Three, professing Christians today, and this is sad to say, this is my experience, are often very unforgiving, which is anti-Christian and hypocritical, or they do not understand principles of Christian forgiveness due to the prevalence of antinomianism and or ignorance. <coughs> it is crucial that we understand what forgiveness is for, obviously, it's man's greatest need before God. And also because it is necessary for the smooth, healthy functioning of churches. And families. Everything. Now, before we look at forgiveness in detail, there are a few other introductory matters to consider. First, the context of this verse is important for Paul's pattern of Christian sanctification where sinful attitudes, thinking, and behavior is to be put off and replaced with a good, lawful, positive Christian counterpart. And you can look at that in Ephesians 4, 22 to 32. The requirement of forgiveness is the positive counterpart to what we just read, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, malice, and evil speech noted in verse 31. Don't do this. Instead, do this. Now, Paul notes earlier that anger in itself is not a sin as long as it's handled biblically and it leads directly to reconciliation. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. If someone is offended by another and does not seek Christian forgiveness and reconciliation, they can become bitter in their thinking. And that, of course, leads to other sins. Under such circumstances, hatred, resentment, anger, and thoughts of revenge can build up in the heart. This inner unreserved, unresolved turmoil can lead to sinful outbursts of anger as well as many forms of evil speech, such as insults, gossip, gossip is, there's a plague of gossip in churches today, slander, and a false testimony. It is the source of many conflicts within the church. Solomon warns us regarding unresolved bitterness, resentment, and hatred within the heart, and the fruit of it, the fruit it produces in Proverbs 26, 23 to 26. 
fervent lips with a wicked heart are like earthen vessels covered with silver dross. He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. When he speaks kindly, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness shall be re revealed before the assembly. And that is oh so true. Uh, when I've encountered people that were habitual gossips and full of hatred, <clears throat> uh, they would couch things and present themselves as very nice and very concerned about people's welfare. I'm concerned about the church. I'm concerned. And what they're trying to do is dig up dirt to use to gossip. The alternative to Christian forgiveness and reconciliation is an inner bitterness resentment and hatred that boils over into all sorts of unbiblical harmful acts and speech. Paul presents biblical forgiveness that is always connected to reconciliation as the only solution to underlying thoughts of hatred, resentment, and revenge. We must destroy the sinful thoughts and attitudes that lead to sinful words and actions through Christian forgiveness and the reconciliation that it brings. And, you know, because we're, this, we're talking about this topic, we, we will be bringing in tangentially Matthew 18, 15 and following, and Luke 17. I think it's 3 and 4. Uh, Luke 17 is the parallel to Matthew 18. It just doesn't go into as much detail. Second, Paul points at various <coughs> Christian attributes, attitudes, or virtues that proceed and undergird Christian forgiveness. <coughs> Kindness and tenderness of heart. Kindness and tenderness of heart. The parallel passage in Colossians 3.12 adds, it's a little more detailed, tender mercies, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. These attributes or states of mind are required by God. So let's just look at them briefly. This is the underlying condition of being a forgiving person, of being uh, ready to reconcile and ready to forgive. Be kind, present imperative, and put on aorist imperative. So they're not voluntary. The fact that we have commands indicates that we are to adopt these attributes because they are required by God and do not wait until our emotions or feelings are in sync with these attributes. So what God is telling us is we have to control our emotions and we have to get our emotions in line with what God requires. You know, we can't say, well, I have no control over my emotions. That's something I can't control. Well, no, you have to control them. God says so. Our intellect is to be conformed to Scripture, and our emotions or at attitudes are to be subjected to our biblically informed conscience. And Jay Adams, of course, is excellent on all of this. Competent to counsel, the Christian Council's manual, and many other books. He's written many books. <clears throat> I think he's still alive. Oh, no, he died? Okay, well, he's gone. I went to seminary with his son back in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, if the emotions aren't there, because you're angry, somebody's really messed you over or whatever, uh, the thing is to, to do the right thing, submit to scripture, and the emotions will get in line eventually. But the point is, is that the intellect is to control our emotions, not the other way around. The Bible teaches the supremacy, the primacy of the intellect. Well, let's briefly note these necessary Christian attributes. The word kindness... Christotes is an aspect of goodness. The word can be translated goodness. It is a way of thinking and acting that is the opposite of badness or malice. <clears throat> in Romans 11.22, it is set in opposition to severity. Apatomia. One who is kind is merciful, not cruel or harsh. He is friendly, tender, gracious, sympathetic, 
helpful and, when necessary, gentle. Goodness is the outgoing action of a kind spirit. Its expression is in concrete deeds. Plainly, both kindness and goodness are terms that accompany one another. Where one exists, usually the other does also. Kindness of spirit seeks reconciliation and forgiveness. Okay, you see a guy, see a homeless person, and he walks over and kicks over his drink or spits on him. That's not being kindness. That's being wicked. Kindness would try to help him in a way or, or whatever. Number two, <clears throat> so that's kindness. The expression tender-hearted corresponds to tender mercies in Colossians 3.12. It refers to a heart that is sensitive to the needs of others and thus has compassion on them. Okay, not how can I get even? How can I damage this person's reputation? How can I uh, mess this person over? Complete opposite attitude. Completely the opposite attitude. A sensitive heart a heart that is sensitive to the needs of others and has compassion on them. It pities people in their sin or calamity and reaches out to relieve their suffering in a biblical manner. And of course, Jesus was the supreme example of someone who was compassionate and sought to relieve the suffering of those who were sick, demon-possessed, and especially those burdened with a sense of guilt. Heart compassion reflects God's mercy and is absolutely necessary for churches full of saved sinners to function. Churches have all kinds of people in them, people who would never be friends in real life. You know, you might have somebody who's raised in the South, they like country music and they're into this and they're into that. You might have somebody raised in the North who's into jazz and completely different type of people. doesn't matter. We're all to get along and be a functioning body because the Bible requires it. We don't have, you know... I was in a church where, you know, the strict Puritan types hated football, thought it was stupid, and offended some other people who liked football. Now, obviously, we're not to make Sunday a football day, but even though those people differ, there's no, it's not a sin to hate football, and it's not a sin to like football. Uh, so those people should get along and, and, not, and bury the hatchet and not make an issue out of it. <clears throat> We had a lady get all upset about it and basically hated people in the church because they didn't like football. That's absolutely ridiculous. <clears throat> Hate and malice is pleased with a person's fall and kicks them when they're down. A tender-hearted, compassionate, merciful Christian pities such a brother and uses scriptural methods to lift him up. Makes sense, too. I mean, read the, the Proverbs. So that is tender-hearted or tender mercies. Number three, <coughs> meekness and humility are also needed for forgiveness and reconciliation. A person who is humble regards others as more important than self and thus seeks to help them in their need and not tear them down. Somebody's sins, do what you can to help them. Paul elaborates this on this virtue in Philippians 2, 3 to 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Humility is obviously necessary to maintain fellowship, unity, and harmony. This Christian virtue rejects an egotistical, self-centered spirit, and thus is willing to seek reconciliation with those who have sinned or offended us. Remember, we're not to follow our emotions. We don't do what we feel like doing. We do what the Bible tells us we have to do. We get our intellect in line with Scripture, and then we obey the scriptures whether our emotions are in line or not. Now, if you obey scripture, eventually the emotions will get in line. But we don't follow our emotions. 
instead of being offended and walking away and or gossiping, which is common, it seeks healing and restoration for it regards the other believer as more important than self. And you can see these, these Christian virtues uh, are contrary to human nature, sinful human nature. They're very contrary. Humility and Christian love gives a believer the benefit of doubt, does not prejudge, but communicates effectively, and is slow to anger and ready to forgive. The person who is humble is also meek. The biblical idea of meekness does not mean weak or passive. Okay, the Nazis in Germany hated Christianity because they thought it meant Weakness. Christianity is not weak at all. At all, Hitler and Napoleon and all these, and, and Putin and all these worldly morons, they're going to come and go. Christ will have total victory. The biblical idea of meekness does not mean weak or passive. The one who is meek is humble before God and seeks to place God's will above his own. The word is sometimes translated gentle, mild, or humble, but these terms do not fully convey the idea of meekness as a Christian virtue. The word has in it the notion of soothing as an ointment soothes or as the words of a peacemaker soothes the parties to an argument. A meek person knows how to pour oil on troubled waters while not ignoring problems. So meekness is not antinomian. It doesn't say yes to sin. It has to deal with sin, but it does so in a healing manner. Meekness is a quality then that enables a Christian when to, uh, when to speak or act, how to speak or act, and what to say or do for another. And of course, once again, who's the supreme one example of meekness? Well, Jesus Christ is. Meekness is crucial for helping believers who have fallen into sin. The person who is uh, brash and arrogant approaches problems from a self-serving, egotistical perspective. But a meek person communicates in a humble, wise, and healing manner. And Jesus is the perfect example of someone who was meek. While he never condoned or compromised with sin one iota, he consistently reached out to save sinners. Today, you know, the idea of forgiveness and the idea of meekness and humbleness and all these kind of things today is antinomian. And uh, there's a stupid ad on you, these ads you see on YouTube. Uh, Jesus is one of us. Have you seen those? And uh, one of the things they're showing to show what Christians should not be is somebody holding a sign, God hates fags or something to that effect. Um, that is not a wise way to approach witnessing to people. Uh, but it's not untrue. And it doesn't mean we uh, agree that their position is moral. The other virtue mentioned is long-suffering. Mekrothumia. This word is also translated as patience or forbearance. It is, a crucial, for it is crucial for reconciliation, for it refers to one who is slow to anger, who refrains from taking revenge or retaliating. This virtue is necessary for one is required by scripture not to retaliate for a wrong, but to follow all the biblical procedures for attaining forgiveness and reconciliation. Matthew 18, 15 and following. Luke 17. <clears throat> this virtue is especially needed when someone who sinned against us becomes, uh, because of our sinful natures, will, not want, will want instant payback. We want revenge. That's the sinful nature. In such a situation, self-restraint is necessary, however, in that Christian love and humility places the other Christian first and therefore requires a biblical response. If we really love and care for a feral believer, we will restrain our desire to lash out against him for the sake of uh, helping him become a better Christian. Paul says this twice in Corinthians that the work of the ministry is for edification, not destruction. Yeah, sometimes excommunication is inevitable. You, you can't avoid it. But the goal is always retrieval and healing. That's the goal, always. That's the first goal. 
We strive for edification, reconciliation, and peace instead of a fleshly desire to get even. To get even. <clears throat> this process, which is designed for the sanctification and retrieval of a sinning brother, requires a humble patience. There are various steps that have to be gone through. If the person is not cooperative, and you have to sit and wait and be humble and pray and wait and not take action, other than following Matthew 18, obviously. The virtue is needed not only due to the time necessary for reconciliation, but also due to the fact that forbearance is required so as not to bring up the forgiven sin in the future. And I've seen this repeatedly over the years where people will supposedly reconcile and then the, the offended party keeps bringing the sin up after they've supposedly reconciled, and that's completely forbidden by Scripture. When you reconcile and there is forgiveness, the sin is not to be brought up ever again. You're not to bring it up again. <clears throat> Christians are to bear injuries, wrongs, insults, and troubles patiently as they seek biblical solutions. There are other Christian virtues necessary for reconciliation, such as love, self-control, faithfulness, righteousness, etc. But we have covered the ones noted specifically in the context of forgiveness and reconciliation from both Colossians and Ephesians. In addition, we should keep in mind the interconnectedness and interdependence of these Christian virtues. <clears throat> Meekness, patience, love, kindness, mercy, all these things are interrelated. And that brings us to our next, our central question today. Uh, what is forgiveness? What is forgiveness? All the Christian virtues that we need are noted by Paul in order to lead us to obey the central requirement of this verse, which is to forgive. Ephesians 4.32, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiveness is a crucial aspect of biblical Christianity, yet it is often misunderstood in our day. Many people associate forgiveness with having good feelings or happy emotions towards someone who has committed a wrong. But God requires us to forgive a brother whether we feel like it or not. or have wonderful positive emotions toward him, or not. Forgiveness may lead to better emotions, and eventually I think they will, but we must not confuse forgiveness with an emotional state. They're not the same thing. The key to defining forgiveness biblically is found toward the end of verse 32. <coughs> Even as God and Christ forgave you. So our forgiveness must reflect God's forgiveness. If we study how the Lord forgives believers, then we will understand what God requires of us. Now, when we look at Yahweh's forgiveness of his people, we see that it is not some emotional sentiment, but rather a putting away of sin and guilt in such a way that it is not remembered, brought up, were held against the believer ever again. Here, let's just look at a few passages to you know really get this in our thinking. Psalm 32, 1 to 2. This is a Paul quotes this in Romans. This is one of the most amazing passages. This is David, King David. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. There is here a threefold Hebrew triadic use of terms to describe God's pardoning of sin. Forgiving the transgression, covering the sin, and not imputing the iniquity. The first verb, nasa, refers to lift, uh, lifting up or carrying away a burden. That's what it literally means. Take away the burden. It depicts God through Christ taking away the burden or record of a believing sinner's guilt. Sin is removed, expiated. 
Although G only Jesus' sacrifice can remove guilt, we must forgive because God has forgiven us. Matthew 6, 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We are commanded to forgive because we have been forgiven. If Christ has taken away the guilt, then we must acknowledge that the guilt has been removed and act accordingly. To refuse to forgive is to implicitly reject the sacrificial blood of Christ or his death on the cross. That's how important this topic is. And that is why in the Lord's Prayer and other places in Scripture, Matthew 18, for example, Jesus says, if you're not willing to forgive a brother who repents, he flat out says, you're not a Christian. God won't forgive you. He's not teaching that being a forgiving person is, is some kind of merit that earns eternal life. He's saying that if you're not willing to forgive a brother, it shows that you're not really a believer in Christ. You don't have the fruits of faith. The expression to cover, kaka, one sins, indicates that God no longer looks upon or regards the sin. The idea is that the sin is no longer in God's sight. It is covered by Jesus' blood. This thought is brought out in Isaiah 43, 25. Even I, I, even I, am the one, am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake. I will not remember your sins. Yahweh, through Jesus' redemptive work, covers our iniquities, Psalm 85, 2, or washes them away, Psalm 51, 2. As far as the east is from the west, so, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103.12. And then Isaiah 1.18. Though your sins are like scarlet, it's a dark, dark red, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And Micah 7.19. He will have compassion on us and subdue our iniquities. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Okay, it's as though they're in the Mariana Trench. God will not look upon your sins anymore. He puts them away. Our Lord's covering over our sins was typified on the Day of Atonement. Beautifully. And if you, old, if you understand your Old Testament effectively, uh, you'll it really shows how the New Testament is absolutely true. On the Day of Atonement, once a year, the high priest... Sacrifice a clean animal, take that blood, go into the Holy of Holies. He only goes into the Holy of Holies once a year. In the Holy of Holies, there is the um, cherubim facing each other. There's the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. Under the mercy seat is what? The Ten Commandments and, of course, the budded rod. But there's a copy of the Ten Commandments in there. What does he do with the blood? He takes it and he sprinkles it all over the mercy seat. Well, the cherubim that are facing each other and their wings are touching, you've probably seen pictures, that represents the special kind of presence that hovers above the ark. God's special kind of presence hovers above the ark. So what is the symbolism here? The symbolism is quite amazing. The blood of Christ is interposed, it is placed between God's special presence and the law of God. So the law of God is covered. Your sins are covered. God can no longer look upon your guilt. That's the symbol, sim, symbolism here. The sacrificial blood was placed between God's special presence and the moral law, symbolizing Jesus' covering of our iniquities. The statement that God does not... Oh, I, I just want to... This commentator was so good. This is A.F. Kilpatrick. Kirkpatrick. He taught at Cambridge University in the late 1800s. <coughs> Abley summarizes the teaching of these verses. Transgression, sin, iniquity. The words just read are described sin in three in, in different aspects. One is rebellion or breaking away from God. Two, as wandering from the way or missing the mark. 
In the New Testament word hamartia, it means to miss the mark. Three, as depravity or moral distortion. Exodus uh, 34, 7. Forgiveness is also triply described. One, as the taking away of a burden. See John 1, 29. That's the one where he sees Jesus and, you know, here's Jesus who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, and the expression to bear iniquity. Number two, as covering, so that the foulness of sin no longer meets the eye of the judge and calls for punishment. Three, as the canceling of a debt which no longer reckoned against, is no longer reckoned against the offender. See 2 Samuel 19.19. 19. <clears throat> the statement that God does not impute, and the word impute, kash hab, my pronouncement of Hebrew is horrible. That God does not impute iniquities means that God does not reckon them to our account. <clears throat> because Jesus paid the full penalty for sin and guilt, God regards the record of a believer as spotless and perfect. You have to keep this in your mind. Otherwise, you'll always doubt your salvation. You'll be miserable. And you'll, because we know in and of ourselves, we're not worthy at all. So you have to remind yourself of these kind of passages over and over and over again and look to Christ. We are not worthy. We're rotten, filthy sinners. But God does not look upon our sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ. He does not reckon our sins to us. The believing sinner is regarded as spotless judicially and for, or forensically, that is courtroom language, even though he himself is not sinless. Luther called it an alien righteousness. It's not your righteousness, it belongs to Christ. Moreover, <clears throat> the perfect righteousness of Christ is also imputed to the believer's account. Consequently, our Lord not only removes the guilt by enduring the curse or penalty of the law, Galatians 3.13, but also establishes the perfect positive righteousness necessary to merit eternal life. Remember, you need two things to go to heaven. Your record has to be perfect. No sin, not even one. And there has to be a perfect positive righteous established. The covenant of works has to be fulfilled. Who does both? Who takes care of both for us? Jesus does. David describes the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord imputes righteousness apart from works. Paul says, Romans 4, 6. God forgives us completely and perfectly because Jesus rendered a full and perfect satisfaction to God the Father on the cross. So when we talk about forgiveness, this is what the Bible is talking about. <clears throat> it's amazing. Our brief consideration of God's forgiveness of believers' sins through Jesus Christ tells us that when we forgive a brother, we no longer remember their sins. In other words, we're not going to be bringing it up anymore. You're not allowed to bring it up. Isaiah 43, 25, Jeremiah 31, 34. Or look upon or think about the sins. We're not to dwell on it and harbor bitterness in our heart. Psalm 32, 1, 82, 2, 103, 12. And thus, <coughs> we regard the record as clean or spotless. Psalm 32, 1, 82, 2, 103, 12. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Psalm 32, 2, 51, 2, Isaiah 1, 18, and Micah 7, 19, etc. And thus we regard their record as clean or spotless. That doesn't mean they're personally perfect. That doesn't mean they're perfectly righteous. It means we regard it as so due to what Christ has done. We can't bring up the sin anymore. At all. And we're not even supposed to be thinking about it. And we certainly are not to talk about it or bring it up or gossip about it. <coughs> very clear, very simple. That is, we must not bring up or hold their sins against them at all. A forgiven brother is not to be ill-spoken of or gossiped against. He is not to be treated as an unrepentant heathen, disfellowshipped, or mistreated in any way. These gracious ways of treating a brother are not based on an emotional experience but rather are a manner of regarding a brother based directly on Christ's atoning work and the commands of Scripture. Your intellect must control your emotions. 
Your intellect has to be in line with the commands and teaching of Scripture. The emotions might not be on board right away. You might be really ticked off at what so-and-so did. But if you reconcile with them, it's done. You can't bring it up anymore. You can't gossip about it. You can't hold it against them. You can't speak about it. You can't dwell upon it. You're not allowed to talk about it with your wife. You're not allowed to gossip about it. It's over. Does that mean your emotions will be perfect instantly? Probably not. But they'll get in line if you obey Scripture eventually. Because God has redeemed and forgiven us through Christ's work. We have a moral obligation to forgive other Christians. The implication is that if a professing Christian refuses to forgive a brother, he is denying the gospel by his actions. And how many times in Scripture do you see a command where the command is followed by, oh, by the way, if you don't do this command, God's not going to forgive you your sins. We find it in the Lord's Prayer, and we find it in other sections of Scripture. You don't forgive your brother? God's not going to forgive you. We are to forgive our brother his trespasses, just as God has forgiven us. And then in other places, we are to forgive our brother because God has forgiven us in Christ. And we're warned if we don't forgive our brother, it shows that we're not even a Christian. That's how serious this topic is. Now, God, of course, is omniscient. And he knows everything. He doesn't forget anything. He knows everything instantly at once. You know, he's not in time like we are, where time is a created thing. <clears throat> he cannot forget anything. Therefore, when he repeatedly promises Christians that he will no longer remember their sins, it is a graphic, anthropomorphic way of teaching that he will not bring up these sins or hold them against us any longer because Jesus has removed them judicially. Of course God remembers all your sins. He remembers things you don't even remember. He remembers what happened on the day you were born. He remembers what was going on when you were in the womb. You don't remember all that stuff. Therefore, when we forgive a brother for a sin or for sins, we are not, bring, we are not to bring them up any longer, and we are not allowed to hold them against our brother at all. And that sounds very simple, doesn't it? But I, it's violated all the time. I've seen people supposedly reconcile and then have the people split apart from each other years down the road over the sin that was supposedly forgiven. Years later, why are you leaving? Why are you doing this? Because you did this back in 1943 or 1978 or 1998. Totally unbiblical behavior. Shows that the reconciliation was never really true. It was never sincere. Now, does this requirement mean that on the inside, all hurt feelings or bruised egos are completely happy and at peace 100% of the time? And the answer is no. Because we are all still sinners and do not have absolute control over our thoughts and emotions. You know, they're, they're you get screwed over by somebody, and there's going to be hurt feelings there. But even though we may have some lingering negative thoughts or emotions, we must attempt to control them, and we must never do or say anything contrary about the forgiven brother and his forgiven sins. So if you're having negative thoughts about a brother that you've reconciled with and you've forgiven, you have to keep them to yourself. You're not to talk about it. Jesus teaches that when a Christian repents and asks for forgiveness, we must forgive him from the heart. In other words, this is not optional, people. This is an absolute requirement of being a Christian. And I say that because I know professing Christians who are super unforgiving and will never forgive people for anything. I've gone to such I've gone to people like that and I said, Well what about Matthew eighteen? Why would I want to do that? I don't want to do that. What's well, right in the Bible? You have to do it. <laughs> if we do not forgive, then once again it is tangible evidence that we do not have true faith and are not real Christians at all.
And this point is emphasized by our Lord in a parable. And this is Matthew 18, 21 to 35. And Jesus spoke this after his teaching on reconciliation earlier in, in the chapter. And he, he does this parable to show how important this topic is. Then Peter came to him and said, this is after God says you have to forgive him seven times 70 or whatever Christ says there. And the disciples were like shocked by this. And Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Which means there's no limitation to this forgiveness. There's no limitation. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That's a ton of money. I forget what that is equivalent to, but it's probably over $30,000. Maybe $100,000. It's a lot of money. That's silver. But he, as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold and his wife and children and all that he had. They're going to be sold into slavery. And that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. 10,000 talents. It's a ton of money. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, which is hardly anything. And he laid his hands on him. He took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. But he would not. But he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. And that, that, this is very realistic. There was a thing called debtor prison. And they would take the guy and throw them in there, and your family members were left to scramble and try to borrow money and get money to get you out of debtor's prison. So when his fellow servant saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt that you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, to each one of you, from his heart, uh, to, to you, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Pretty radical. <laughs> but that's what the Bible says. We have to forgive. We don't have any choice. If we don't, we're not Christians. That's what Jesus says. So according to Jesus and Paul, forgiving a brother is not optional. It is absolutely essential as a fruit of faith in Christ. This strong requirement is not simply a pragmatic command, so there are no longer loose ends in the church. So congregations will have peace and harmony. As crucial as these things are, and I've been in churches that fell apart and split over, over stupid things. I was in a church that split over youth groups. Some people didn't believe in it, some people believed in it. So the people who believed in youth groups persecuted the people who didn't believe in youth groups. And that got me fired and <laughs> all this stuff, even though I didn't teach on it because the, church, the denomination I was in allowed youth groups. And of course, youth groups can be set up in a way that's biblical if, if, if the fathers are in control of it. It's, it's up to the fathers to decide whether they want to have a baseball team or whatever. It's not up for the church to set it up and demand that people go. Paul notes this observation in Colossians 3, 12 to 13. And here's that parallel passage we've been discussing. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you must do also. Not optional. A refusal to forgive is treated as an explicit contradiction to the gospel of grace by Paul 
and by Jesus. Now just one quick footnote here. When Jesus or Paul speak to us about reconciliation and forgiveness, they are discussing sin, real sin, violations of the moral law of God. Now this is obvious, I shouldn't have to point this out, but I point it out because of legalism and because people get offended all the time about things that aren't sins at all. And they shouldn't get offended about things that aren't sins. If you like to listen to Willie Nelson and you like to listen to Miles Davis and let's say I'm into uh, Joe Cocker or whatever, there's differences in the church. So what? Don't make an issue out of it. There are things that are not sins. You're act talking about violations of God's law. The fact that sin is being discussed is important for two reasons. It means that Christians should not take offense over personalities, ethnic, ethnic issues, cultural or socioeconomic differences. And I've seen people in churches that I don't regard as Christians who hated people and mistreated people because of differences of opinion about things like sports or culture or food. These are not things to, to get angry about and make an issue out of. The church is made up of all sorts of people. When I went to seminary, we had a bunch of Koreans in seminary. And they ate the most stinky, disgusting food you could think of, you know, kimchi. And they'd make this kimchi, which is rotten, basically moldy vegetables, rotten vegetables. And it, the whole floor stunk to the high heavens. Didn't hold it against them. They were very pious, pious guys. The Koreans would get up and pray, get up out of bed at five in the morning and pray for two hours. They're the most pious guys there. <clears throat> There are all sorts of rubs and offenses that occur between Christians and even husbands and wives that do not rise to the level of sinful offenses that merit the discipline process. Oh, honey, I forgot to cook your eggs. Oh, I forgot to get the mail. There's all kinds of little rubs and things they shouldn't be made an issue out of. Moreover, a number of Christians are offended by trivial things that are not sinful at all. And these are the effects often of legalism and Neoplatonic pietism. You know, like don't drink alcohol. You're not allowed to have alcohol at all. And I remember back in the early 90s, I'm, I'm candidating to be a minister in the RP church. And uh, they'd find out, no, I didn't, I don't really drink. I have a drink once in a while. I, I might have one beer once in a while. But I don't really care about alcohol or whether you drink or not. But these guys, these legalistic guys, just knowing that you believe it's okay to have a beer, not get drunk, have a beer or a glass of wine with dinner, uh, you get all angry and you're scum. That's legalism. Neoplatonic pietism. Minor offenses should be covered over in love, and we should always give believers the benefit of doubt. In other words, assume the best, not the worst. Have a graceful spirit. Be merciful. Assume the best, not the worst. Here's uh, 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all things, have fervent love one for another, for love covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> much heartbreaking and much needless trouble often comes of offenses which exist only in the imagination. Imagined offenses. A sensitive disposition is often another name for someone who is uncharitable, unforbearing, and suspicious of others without real cause. The professing believer who has a judgmental, suspicious spirit often is guilty of imputing bad motives to others where none exist and of finding sinister, malevolent meanings in the most innocent of acts. And I've known people like this and... They're miserable to be around, and they cause nothing but conflict and trouble in the church. And my position has been, uh, when such people refuse to reconcile, just try to stay away from them as far as possible. Because they're nothing but trouble. Now, if they repent, great. But if they're, if they're going to be this way, it's just nothing but trouble. Because they're always finding fault about everything. God saves all sorts of people, people who you may think are weird, odd, strange, or whatever. 
Remember that both Jesus and Paul are talking about sin, real sin. <coughs> Here's a couple passages. Proverbs 17, 9. He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. And I should have brought this up. I might add this as a footnote or something, but you know the, the passage in, in, in the Old Testament law, love your neighbor as yourself, which Jesus quotes as a summary of the whole moral law. Read the context. The example given by the Holy Spirit through Moses of not loving your neighbor as yourself is if he sin, if he does something wrong, go to him and talk to him privately. Don't gossip about him behind his back and trash his reputation. That's the context for that passage. Yet one of the most common sins in the whole church is gossip. And, you know, gossip's bad enough when what they say is true, but 80% of gossip usually is false. It's usually an exaggeration or slander. <clears throat> Sins which threaten fellowship and the peace of the church, which need a reconciliation process of forgiveness, must be dealt with according to Matthew 18, 15 and following and Luke 17, 3 to 4. Minor offenses and rubs should be overlooked in love. And anybody who's been married for any length of time knows that. You're, you know, you're, you're about to go to bed. You mentioned to your wife, you know, you'd like this her to do something in the morning and she forgets. No big deal. You just cover it with love. It's not a big deal. It's not a sin. <clears throat> and then number two, and we'll end with this because uh, our times ran out. Next week, our first topic next week will be, uh, is forgiveness conditional or unconditional? That's a very important topic. So, Stay tuned for next week. Uh, number two, the fact that Christ and Paul are talking about real sin means that personal uh, charges against a brother must be objectively proved from the Bible. Objectively proved from the Bible. Scripture protects believers from legalism, subjectivism, and all arbitrary human standards. Thus, if you are going to your brother and accuse him of sin, you better make sure it is a real sin and not some subjective feeling or some legalistic nonsense. If someone accuses you of sin and you aren't sure what you did wrong, ask for scriptural proof. This principle seems rather obvious. It makes sense. It's common sense. Yet it is constantly violated in churches all the time. It's violated by church courts. When I was in the RPCNA, in the 90s, this is uh, probably 94, 95, uh, I passed all the exams. I was eligible to receive a call. I had been called by a church. Then I had to go to a different presbytery, and I passed all the exams again. And they examined me for two solid 12-hour days. I passed all the exams. My sermon passed. And then they said, well, we're not going to ordain him for a whole year. We want to keep an eye on him. <laughs> they violated the scriptures. They violated their own blue book. Um, and I wanted to know why. Nobody ever told me why. Now, I know why. Uh, I criticize the NIV as being a bad translation based on a bad text, and these guys, most of them use the NIV. I criticize celebrating Christmas as unbiblical in a human tradition. They all celebrated Christmas. <laughs> I believed in head coverings. None of them did. So it was really a doctrinal issue, but... If you're going to delay somebody's ordination and imply that there's something wrong with this guy, you need to come to them and say, this is why. You did this, 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 and this. That's all. Be specific. If you're upset with your wife and you think she sinned, tell her exactly what it is, or likewise with the husband. What you don't want to hear, and when you know something is wrong, is when people use general categories. He's an evil person. Or so-and-so is divisive. Now, this is a, what was said about me in the RPCNA. I was accused of splitting a church, which I didn't do. It was an elder uh, who divided the church over uh, youth groups. I had nothing to do with it. Um, and I asked the pastor when this was going on. I, I talked to this. I called this pastor up, a very prominent pastor in this presbytery. I says, well, tell me, what have I done that's divisive? You know, if I've done something divisive, tell me what it is. Because I was lawfully transferred to another church. I was lawfully transferred to another presbytery without any rebukes or anything. Well, there's smoke there. 
That was that was his response. There's smoke. Well, that's not helpful to me. If somebody's in sin, if something doing somebody's doing something wrong, especially somebody who's an elder or a pastor, and you want to help them be better at their job, tell them what it is and be specific. But when people use general categories, and you see this with Democrats too, the way they treat Republicans they don't like. General categories, don't cut it. You have to be specific. People are chided and harassed for many things that have nothing to do with sin and everything to do with legalistic, subjective nonsense. If offenses are not based on God's law, but only human opinion or imagination, this should be discovered during the three-step judicial process that Christ mentions in Matthew 18, 15, and following. A particular sin or sins committed must be identified and proved by specific references to Scripture. That is your right if you're the accused person, and that is your duty if you're, you're the accuser. And the whole point is, how can we be sanctified? How can we be better? How can we repent? How can reconciliation and all this stuff be handled if you don't know what specifically what the sin is? If they identify the sin and you're guilty of the sin, you admit the sin, you repent of the sin, reconciliation and forgiveness is achieved immediately. Very simple. But churches violate this, you know, of course, I, I was in the RPCNA and I was in a really corrupt presbytery that basically did whatever they wanted. They completely, basically ignored their own blue book in the scriptures when it served their purpose. But we'll end there. Next week, our first topic of item will be, Lord willing, uh, is forgiveness conditional or unconditional? In other words, does a person have to repent or do you just like these people? You see these people on TV and the, the, the guy was just convicted of murder, and he's flipping off the judge, and he's laughing at the victims. Uh, do you have to forgive him for murdering your daughter and raping her and cutting off her head? Uh, or is it conditioned upon him repenting? We'll look at that next week. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Your scripture contains incredible wisdom and truth. Help us to obey and be forgiving. Help us have these Christian attributes which are necessary for proper forgiveness so that we can have real healing and real unity. In Jesus' name, amen.